Good morning, everyone. Um, this is uh, part of a process that began in May with our uh, discussion of uh, potential capital changes in our uh, church. Uh, today we'll be uh, hearing from the Green Sanctuary Committee about initiatives that they think uh, are important to our church. Um, this is uh, a part of the process, part of the democratic process, that will hopefully allow us to arrive at a list of priorities uh, that the church will find meets its needs and are consonant with our expressed values and um, goals. Um, again, this is really just part of a process, and there will be plenty of time as we go by for people to weigh in, consider, make recommendations and suggestions. Um, but today we'll be hearing about uh, the variety of um, options that the church may have for improving our green footprint through the use of ground source, uh, heat pump, uh, solar, and other options. So let's hear today from the Green Sanctuary Committee. Thank you, Eric. Uh, in case somebody doesn't know, I'm Karen Stanky. I'm the chairperson of the Green Sanctuary. And I've got Dan Kosuth and Anna's Pratt is up here today with me helping with the presentation. Um, we want it to be informal. We want to give you information and we want your input. The mission of the Green Sanctuary is to help BUC and assist us in aligning with our seventh principle, which is the respect for the interdependent web of all of nature, including ourselves. We want, together, a capital campaign offers us the opportunity to take a big step towards fulfilling this by decreasing the carbon footprint of BUC. Uh, Dan's going to start out with some actual information. Although the 
term geothermal has been used to describe a potential new system for PUC. We actually have no intention of installing a geyser in the social media. <laughs> After all, we really don't need one as our political discussions have been to generate a substantial amount of steam. <laughs> so, as you can see, this is somewhat less dramatic, but far more practical than a geyser. And yes, lots of people still refer to this as a geothermal system because the source of the heat is in the earth. For clarity, however, we're going to try to stick to the term ground source heat pump, or GSHP. So, you know what that is? How many of you have refrigerators in your home? Oh, everybody, great. Yeah. Well, that, that means that you're all familiar with heat pumps. Your refrigerator is pumping heat. It's taking it out of your tomatoes, out of your orange juice, out of your ice cream, and it's delivering that heat to warm the little dust bunnies back behind the fridge. <laughs> Here's the uh, basic idea behind a heat pump. In the example of your refrigerator, the coils inside the freezer compartment are on the source side, and the radiator coils on the back or top of the unit are on the plant side. What goes on between is not really magic, exactly, but we don't need to understand that. It's all technical. Uh, so for right now, we'll let that aside. If you have a window air conditioner, the source side is on the interior of your home, and the unit is removing heat from the air and moving it to the plant side, where it's dumped on the doors. Now imagine that if you could reverse the flow so that it's cooling the outside, and dumping the heat inside. Voila, you now have an air-to-air -air heat pump that can both heat and cool your own. This is a picture of an open loop system. And it's again, basically it's a heat pump, but with a ground source heat pump, the constant temperature of the earth is the exchange medium instead of the more variable outside air temperature. That allows the system to reach highly uh, efficient or fairly high efficiencies of 300 to 600 percent. That's right, 300 to 600 percent efficiency. That means that for every unit of uh, energy you put in, you get three to six units back out. Uh, and that's on the coldest nights of the year compared to an air to air exchanger, which can uh, approach 175 or even 250 percent efficiency during cool days. As it gets colder, the efficiency drops off rather quickly. Now, why is it that the ground source is so much better than the air to air? Think about this. A pair of hot pads will protect you from the hot cookie sheet, while the 350 degree air that's coming out of the oven hitting your skin doesn't bother you at all. But you sure don't want to put your hand into the pot of boiling water. What's the difference? Both the heat transfer coefficient and the specific heat capacity or thermal capacity differs between materials. That's why water or metal feels hotter than air at the same temperature. It holds more heat and transfers it more readily. This helps explain why a ground source heat pump is so much more efficient than an air air heat pump. Given, given a, a particular level of technology, it simply does a more efficient job transporting the heat. Now that open loop system uh, is something the Green Sanctuary Committee has been advocating for, for completion of uh, to heat the uh, heat and cool the social hall. The, the old, I should say ancient, uh, gas-fired furnace in the basement of the social hall uh, used to heat, never did cool, but used to heat the social hall, and it died some years ago. Um, we'd like to use an existing well, the old well on the property here, which is working and, and produces plenty of water. We'd like to use that as a source uh, for water <coughs> to operate an open loop system. Uh, however, people have pointed out the recent flood in the basement uh, casts some doubt on the ability of our retention pond to absorb the amount of water that would be used, especially during heavy rains. That's a real concern. Um, another possibility, we could get around that by drilling an additional recharge well 
uh, to put the cooled or heated water, which has changed by just a couple of degrees, uh, but we put that back into the aquifer and have, have the system working that way. Uh, if those concerns can be met, it would be possible to have at least some of our heating and cooling needs met with a very earth-friendly system. Another possibility might be a closed loop system. As you can see here, the uh, water is circulated through a, a series of pipes that are buried underground. It takes a lot of piping underground, which means a large area. Um, this system can be one of the most efficient variants of the gravity source heat pump system, but because it ex requires extensive excavation, it's often also the most expensive. That said, in our green dreams, we'd love to replace the blacktop on the parking lot with a permeable surface to help eliminate runoff into the storm sewer, which eventually, via the Rouge River watershed, ends up in the Great Lakes. Uh, if we combine replacement of the parking lot with the excavation for a closed loop system, we could, you know, double the money, so to speak. Uh, and that would allow us to put a closed loop system big enough to handle the entire church. Now that would be something that would serve seven generations of your use. So real briefly, the pros for a geothermal system uh, or ground source heat pump system. Uh, pros would be that it uses minimal electricity. That reduces our carbon footprint. It eliminates the use of natural gas for heat. It's more, it's more efficient than most other systems, including most other uh, heat pump systems. We already have a well in place uh, that could be used for our local new system. The new system would meet all the code requirements for our upgrades of the air handling system, which are going to be required no matter what we do with that furnace. Um, another big advantage is that utility savings would begin immediately. Once you turn this thing on, we don't buy any more gas for the, the social hall. So we're saving right away. These systems are proven. They have a long service life, a low maintenance cost. Uh, they're very easy to use. That's great. On the con side, the open loop system for the social hall does not change anything for the remaining buildings on our campus. The discharge water, if we use an open loop system, uh, could be a problem. Uh, the fact is that the geothermal system in the very short term will be more expensive than replacing the social hall with gas fire unit, uh, plus air conditioning. But the payback would be there, and eventually we'd be actually saving a fair amount of money on it. Uh, that payback is measured in years. It's not months. It's not short term. Uh, if we go to a closed loop system, it's substantially more expensive. Again, payback, but longer term. Uh, one other thing is that as long as we're using electricity, and we're going to use electricity for any of these systems, uh, the electricity comes from DTE. They burn coal, one of the dirtiest schools around. A huge carbon footprint. So if we can get away from using electricity, that would be a good thing. Okay, so that's the ground sourced heat pump. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Annis to talk about solar panels. Good morning. So I'll help you get away from electricity. Okay. Oops. These are uh, some of the uh, 93 wishes for clean energy that came up uh, when we passed around a little. Uh, hexagonal pieces of paper on Earth Day and we made them into a quilt. And as you look at these, um, I'll just, I'm just going to put them up there so you can get an idea of how many of those wishes were for geothermal, which is the old word, uh, or solar energy. Um, 18 of them were for solar energy alone. And there were a number in there. Uh, in which people offered to give us money uh, to build solar energy and geothermal replacements for our current system. I think that was right. Now, um, this is a solar panel, and as you know, that's a very direct system. It takes the energy of the sun and turns it into electricity. Um, a lot of people 
say, well, that's all very well for a place like Arizona or, you know, in the south where you get a lot of sunshine. Uh, actually, you don't, uh, it, you don't need intense direct sunlight uh, to get solar power out of the sun through solar panels. If you look at this chart, you'll see that even the northeastern states in the United States have greater solar potential than Germany, as can be seen in this map. Uh, Germany is in purple over here, and we are getting plenty enough solar energy from the sun, from the sun on a year-wide basis. In spite of the fact that Germany is the current leader in solar power generation, uh, this is a chart of solar PV operating capacity by county. Uh, Europe is going very, very fast towards uh, clean, renewable energy, much faster than this country is. But it is the wave of the future. Um, if you look at this uh, city map, you'll see that we actually have 180 total days of sunshine available in Michigan. But the thing that really interests me is the fact that you don't need a completely sunny day to generate solar power. I was told that the ideal day is 55 degrees and overcast, so I did a little experiment. I bought a little solar panel with a little light under it uh, and put it up on my lawn last September. And, you know, I think there were two sunny days this whole winter. Uh, it shone brightly. My little light shone uh, all <laughs> winter long. Now, last March, we had a visit from an, uh, a solar panel installation company called Srinergy, S-R-I-N-E-R-G-Y, a company that works with the Michigan Interfaith Power and Light on solar aggregation models for houses of worship. So it's a solar aggregation company with a particular emphasis on <coughs> spiritual places of this world. Um, and on June 25th, uh, 2013, they gave us a report about PUC's capacity for generating solar power. In their conclusion, they said that through our proposed system, Birmingham Unitarian Church will save significant money on energy costs over the life of the solar system, while at the same time reducing its carbon footprint and setting an example for the surrounding community. My particular individual green dream is to see the solar and the geothermal in and the church surrounded by a green ribbon and every newspaper reporter and television station in town and the region here reporting on what we are witnessing to because of our love with this earth. And here are some results of Serenity's plan. It's going to eliminate 681 metric tons of CO2 emissions. Nice green footprint there during the life of the program. It's got some other little things on there. One of them is about I can't see the numbers from where I am, but a whole number of the equivalent of trees planted is inherent if we install this particular system that was designed for this church by Synergy. Uh, and over here is something like 34,000 households worth of electricity uh, over the lifetime of the system. Uh, but what I, re I really need to tell you about is how I came to be standing up here. Um, talking about something different than I've been talking about in recent years. Um, I had my 76th birthday in April and I had a little think. Uh, I was very worried about global warming and I, I wanted to do something before I curl up my toes, however short and long that period may be, for my beloved planet Earth. I have always felt that when I die, the planet Earth will live on. Now Dan suggests that nature will survive us, but I guess I meant human beings on it, not maybe insects. And I no longer have that trust. Um, the storms and the hurricanes and the surge tides and the fires and the winds um, left me feeling very vulnerable for my beloved planet. Um, so vulnerable that, that, oh, I, I think it may, in that area, I got quite despairing about the whole thing. And I went trotting around talking to, to state Michigan State representatives and the United States representatives about how I felt about being against cracking and being against pipelines. I got the Libertarian to agree with me. But still, that was against stuff. 
And I continue in those efforts, but I, I, it didn't really lift me from my despair. And then I ran into a number of different groups of people who are teaching us how to transform our psychology of despair during this period of Earth's transition. And one of those groups is run by Joanna Macy, who wrote a book about it called Act of Hope. What she says is that before you do anything else, you have to accept the pain that you are feeling. I suppose the first thing you got to do is accept that we're over 350 parts per million. We're past the tipping point for climate change. And significant changes will happen to the Earth. We live with our pain, and we accept it. Then, we will to find actions for the good of the Earth that express our values. Not just our individual values, but we find groups of people who share the same values as we share the seventh generation principle, the love of the Earth, and our feeling of being part of it. And once you find the people and the actions and start doing the actions, you are participating in the best way you can at this time in our history. Well, then I started turning my attention to renewables and clean energy. It was like the wind, went, the wind was beneath my winds. And when I remembered all those wishes in, the, in, in April, I realized that here was a community that was really quite passionate about this very thing that was positive, forward-moving, and would be a witness to the community. Joanna Macy says that future generations will look back at the time we are living in now. The kind of future they look from and the story they tell about our period will be shaped by the choices we make in our lifetimes. Let's make these choices together as our beloved community, and let's help our beloved plan. Thank you. Thank you, Annis and Dan, for sharing some specifics as to what the Green Sanctuary wants to do. And I need to move this up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> I feel like I'm giant here. Um, I want to talk about, you know, how do we plan to do this? What are some of your concerns? What do I see as some more of the benefits? And what some of the thought process of the Green Sanctuary is? Um, I want to talk a little bit more about this concept of return on investment. The people I've talked to in our congregation keep going to me, you know, I believe in renewables and we have to, you know, save the earth, but it's got a lousy return on investment. Well, I, I'm here to say, you know, why are we comparing any initiatives for renewables, you know, to a return on investment for an accounting process in a, you know, strictly run for profit operation? Don't we have other values and morals and ethics that guide us in that? Um, accountants define a return on investment ROI as the number of years it takes to recoup an initial investment. Um, the proposals we've gotten so far from Green Sanctuary are anywhere from 7 to 10 to 12 years return on investment to recoup our initial money. However, I'm saying we need to discredit return on investment in the strict sense of the word. We can start saving money that can be added to our operating budget. As Dan said, you know, the minute we turn this switch and start getting either solar power or um, using the geothermal furnace, we could add thousands of dollars annually to our BUC operating budget, and isn't that a plus? In addition, many of the other proposals that we'll hear throughout this fall have a phenomenal intangible benefits, but you're probably not going to judge landscaping on the return on investment. I'm not sure what the return, you know, and again, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do those things, but I'm trying to say let's compare apples to apples. And while we do need to monitor how much money we're going to spend, maybe it's not strictly, we don't eliminate green sanctuary stuff or going to renewables because the return on investment won't meet, you know, Wall Street's guidelines. I'm not sure when we last followed Wall Street's guidelines here. Um, let's see, I think I haven't done this. Again, the dollar savings. Is, is what I see as a benefit, and I'd rather think of, instead of return on investment, we're going to have dollar savings that we can put back into the operating budget for BUC. I want to recap the pros and cons. It, as far as the pros go, they reduce the carbon footprint. They let us live out our values, especially the seventh principle. We start adding that extra money to our operating budget immediately. The social hall furnace is, as Dan said, the initial furnace has already died, 
We're using a unit on the roof that was designed to cover the kitchen addition and that storage area. Um, we need to think about, you know, what's option C for the social hall on that. Michigan is a good candidate for solar energy, as, as Anna has told us. You don't need the, when the guy from Synergy came to us, he said, we actually more efficiently process solar power than someplace like Arizona does because we don't have those hot, sunny, dry days. You know, it's almost this kind of weather is better for it. He, again, the ideal, he was here in March, 55 degrees is the best temperature to process solar energy. There's other facilities in our area already taking advantage of renewables, which proves, you know, it is possible to do them here. Um, the Ann Arbor UU Church out in Ann Arbor is using solar wind, and the Farmington Hills Municipality has converted to solar, and I believe geothermal also. They've got a phenomenal website where they post their savings and what they've added to their bottom line. Um, these are proven systems we're suggesting with a long service life and a low maintenance cost. Some of the cons, everything has pros and cons, are these solutions only cover part of our energy usage. Um, the so it's only the social hall at this point if all we do is the ground source heating using the open loop or a system. The solar at this point, they seem to be recommending only about 35 to 37% of our usage of energy, uh, electricity be converted to solar. I'm pushing back on the guy, I think he was a little afraid to give us a quote that was too high. <laughs> you know, what would it be to do 70% of our electric usage? Um, part of that is we may not have enough to generate our electricity, but when we do have good days, we sell it back to DTE, who has to buy it by law from us, and then that puts money in the bank for us, and then when we have to use their energy, you know, it's free. We use up what we have on credit. Um, another con is it requires a large capital investment. This is going to be a capital investment for any of these programs. Probably anywhere we could probably do something with $50,000 up to a couple hundred thousand. Okay, is what we're talking. We're not talking million, we're not talking two million dollars for this. Um, the system paybacks don't meet what's acceptable accounting practices for return on investment. But I argue with, you know, do we really, is that our goal, to be good accountants? In our analysis, we need to consider the carbon footprint of the manufacturers also, and make sure that when we choose a company that it's not doing more polluting than what we are trying to eliminate. I want to do a recap of the Green Sanctuary proposals. We want to decrease our carbon footprint, and in order to do that, we must convert as much as possible to renewable energy sources. In addition to the moral ethical reasons, there are measurable actual dollar savings that can go to our bottom line. There are pros and cons to each type of system. That's why each renewable energy system needs careful, detailed evaluation and comparison. The initial cost, as I said before, could be a couple hundred thousand dollars. On the April Earth Day this past year, um, you, the congregation, submitted in writing. Uh, we were really pleased and when we started totaling them up for this, out of the 93, I think there were 28 directly related to the renewable energy, plus those where there were four where people said, why are we waiting? I'll contribute money to go to renewables. Why aren't we um, having a campaign to raise the funds? I hope some of you are in the room now, and I think you're going to take a check from you at any point in time. <laughs> um, so I, I want to continue that momentum. In addition to those that directly mentioned renewables, there were also 13 that mentioned that people wanted to reduce electric, our electric usage or our energy usage here. And those are certainly some of the things that are being incorporated. Not only did the person who gave us the solar quote also looked at you know, some improved technology systems that we can use to decrease or more efficiently use some of the energy usage we have here. Um, Let's see. In total, then, almost half of the people who filled out those wishes as to what are you willing to do to help the earth back in April, almost half of them had to do with energy and about following our seventh principle and preserving the earth by reducing our carbon footprint. This presentation is just the beginning. 
With the support from you, our next steps would be to get detailed quotes on various types of systems from multiple vendors, you know, fine tune them, fine tune them, evaluate these for their carbon footprint reductions and any dollar savings we can add to our bottom line. Then we want to make recommendations to the board and then assist in raising the funds to finance these re recommendations. So, to do or not to do, what are your thoughts? How would you or we evaluate which capital projects to include? What's our commitment to the seven principle? Are we serious about it? We need to consider the savings, not as return on investment, but rather as an addition to the operating budget. Will all the proposals for the capital budget be using the same evaluation criteria, living our values, rather than amount of money being spent? What about those projects that don't have a measurable, tangible, objective method of calculating returns on investment? Do we skip them? No, of course not. Then why do many of us think of renewable projects in terms of ROI only? I challenge you to follow your heart and our values and principles when looking at these renewable energy projects. If we can do that, then BUC would send out a clear message that we walk the walk and talk the talk of our values. Do you want to be the change you want to see in the world? Um, at this point, I want to open it up to questions and see what some of your concerns are, what your thoughts are. Yay, nay. Carrie. I have two questions. Sure. So the first one is, um, with the, I mean, I, why not go big or go home, right? I'm all, I love the idea of a permeable you know, laptop out there. but. It seems to me I thought that somewhere in the works already is resurfacing the parking lot. Like, what is the time frame before we would have to make that decision if we were going to make the permeable instead of? At this point, what's been done in the parking lot is is really a repair. I'm I'm getting from Eric, right? right. And, and we we backed off on you know doing. We were going to totally resurface it, but said you know in light of both this project and some of the landscaping stuff, that parking lot may change anyway. So let's not let's not spend any more money that we don't have to on some of these repairs. I know uh, there's some sidewalk going to be repaired, and it's been narrowed down to the areas that are a safety issue. Okay. So it's not just kind of in a holding pattern. That's mm -hmm. we have time. Yeah. To right, process. right. Because I think that's going to be rolled into the larger capital project. Correct. We just made the repairs so your mule doesn't break his leg when he walks in this pothole. Right. <clears throat> um, the second question, and it's not exactly related to this, but you know the thing with DTE charge, you know that they have their energy from coal. Like I know that Doug and I, we make a commitment to buy part of our energy from DTE through a program where we're guaranteeing that that's not coming from coal. Is the church involved in that kind of program at all? Yeah, I'm not sure they are, but my understanding, because I belong to that same program, is that for green currents, you're not, the money they're collecting from you is going towards research into renewable energy. I didn't think it was so that, because they can't, I don't believe they can just give you energy that's come from. No, they're not giving, they're not giving us yeah. just energy, but it's saying like that part of their energy commitment right. to making right. sure that it's in renewables is that decreasing the amount that's being I don't know about that and whether or not we're doing that. I know that it is an upcharge, so I'll, I'll check into that and get back to you. You have questions? This isn't exactly a question, but it's uh, affirmation. I'm totally in favor of the plan. I love it. Uh, Thank you. And I want to do the big one. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, and again, we, you know, we've looked at there's a whole breadth of project we can do. I want to mention that I have other house in Monroe, oh. mm -hmm. I think it's a bank on a card there, yes. it's an enormous old brick complex, and it must have been 10 years ago that they decided to go to geothermal heating, and they, they, they went through the same process, you know, of thinking about it, and you can go down there and have a tour, and um, they decided that they would spend the money and all that retrofitting to get the I think that it turned into water. I don't know what brings the heat to each room, but I think each room needed retrofitting to get this change mm -hmm. in this entire building, and, and they still felt it was worth doing. And here we are, what are we, 10 years behind? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, thank I was you. full of nuts, come on. I know that's, 
<laughs> that's on our list of well, potential places as the committee is looking at, you know, and because we want to see provable savings too. Eric? Perhaps I can ask if members of the audience are willing to participate uh, with the Green Sanctuary Committee in doing some of this research and legwork. I'm sure they can use some help. Yes, thank you. See <clears throat> any one of us afterwards or sometime. Any other questions, concerns? Mary? Um, I'm confused about BTE because I've heard from another um, source that they have things set up to their favor that they don't have to buy power that's generated on solar units. And um, so I, I my understanding is that used to be the case, and that there's been I believe the, I, I believe it's a federal law, and they have it's law now that they have to buy it back from us, and they have to buy it at the same price they charge us. Uh, and I would love that. Yeah. Because <laughs> that used to be one of the big drawbacks, was that if we had excess, it would just, it yeah. wouldn't benefit us at all. They get it, what I heard was they get it for free, and no. if we use their energy, we're still paying the same rate. Yeah, that, that was the case. Um, I had some personal experience with that. When I was on the board at the Ecological Awareness Center, we had installed uh, solar panels at a, uh, in turbine. And in trying to set that up with DTE at that time, this is about 10, 12 years ago, um, they said they did not buy it. That you could put stuff into the grid, and the grid would be there for you when your producer, or your production fell out, but you got nothing back. And the law changed, and now they are required to pay you back at the same rate that they're buying it from you, or, or that you're buying it from them. Uh, so it's, it's balances. There is some concern about that, though, because if, and, and I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here, if DTE is required to buy power from you at the same rate that they sell it to you, and if everybody put solar panels on, they would simply be required to provide a grid for free. And that's really not right either. Somebody does have to pay for that grid. So eventually, I think it will evolve into a system where you sell it to them and then you buy it back at a, at a slightly higher price in order to cover the cost of the infrastructure. But wouldn't that be a nice problem that yes. all of DTE's yes. customers had yes. solar? I mean, yeah. isn't that our dream or goal eventually for this whole area? Um, well, it's a system that has closed loop. Will that serve any more than just the solar? Yes. Yeah, we, with the closed loop, we could do our whole canvas. Yeah, okay. But again, probably that cost is four times, you know, and we're, we're testing the waters too. Four times, four times, two hundred thousand. Yeah. Well, at least maybe one. Uh, now, yeah. this, the solar system stuff, okay, <clears throat> I talked this for five years, so okay. I have a little bit of an idea about it. Okay. Now, the open system using at least two wells, is by far the most efficient, cost-wise, and everything. It's the least disturbing to the whole system, but you have to be able to keep your temperature rise in your water, okay, within certain constraints. And they used to, it used to be 10 degrees. I don't know what it is now. We even had the same thing with the condensers from like Edison's power plant. Okay, the water comes in out of the river, goes through the condenser, goes back out into the river. And they couldn't go over a 10 degree temperature rise. So they were, you know, there was problems in that. Especially like when the water in the lake out there gets to 65, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, and you're putting 10 degree hotter water in there. That's an amazing amount of BTU. That's 10,000 BTUs per pound per day. That's a lot going out there. So you can't just just do it. You got roughly, what, 8.3 pounds <coughs> per gallon or something like that. So we have to be very careful about what we do. I would say probably have someone check with the DNR as to what temperature range we can stay within in the water we put back into the ground and a geothermal system, whatever you want to call it, a heat pump system. Just like you're talking about your refrigerators, what one we're most familiar with. All we're doing is moving heat from here to here or from here to here. In the summertime, you take heat out, in the wintertime, you put heat back down. You know, and doing that, the geothermal, the open loop 
ground system, and I think their wells have to be at least 100 feet apart, and preferably two different aquifers. So you might have a well, one well goes down to 200 feet, the other one might go down to 1,200 feet. Now, you could come into some really expensive stuff that way, but it's nothing like filling that whole parking lot out there up with 10 foot deep coil. Because you have to maintain at least 55 degrees. You can't get over that. It's not going to work worth it. So you have to keep the temperature down in order for it to work properly. Now, we'll still have, I don't care what they say, you're going to have a gas pit. Because you have to have a stabilizing boiler to keep your temperature where it's going to work. But still, that's a whole lot cheaper than heating a whole building with heat or with hot air gas which is probably the most expensive heating system there is. There's none that costs more than that, produces more carbon emissions, da 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 goes on and on and on. So if we, we have to look at, we have to, the only thing we really have to look at is for my, I'm concerned, is how can we come up with the money to do the job? Because any of them is going to be better than what we're doing now. Even the closed system out in the parking lot, You'll have numbers of thousands of feet of pipe out there to run. And if one of them breaks, you, you've really got a problem. And you're out of business until it's fixed. But still, the two well system, I think, is best. Of, in my opinion, in a dollar a year, coffee and McDonald's. <laughs> but Thank you. anything we do is going to be better than what we're doing now. All right, thanks for that. Um, did Eric have it? We've got some more questions here. Got Morris, I mean, you haven't spoken well, yet, so. I run a non-profit system in my home. <laughs> and I don't have solar, any solar system. And as I drive around, I don't see them anywhere. Does anyone in here have solar panels? Not in here, but Oakland University has solar yeah, panels. Yeah, all the way at home. Yeah. So what's wrong here? I mean, if we're all into the seventh principle, seventh principle, why haven't we done it? Because money does matter. And the problem we face here is cheap fuel. In Germany, it's very expensive. They have all these solar panels not because they're tree huggers, because it's economically viable. So that's, that really is a problem with cost issue. Incidentally, the entire island of Iceland is geothermal. They produce yeah. their electricity, their heating, their cooling, everything. And they have lots of volcanoes. Right. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very different form of geothermal. Yeah, yeah, right. You're using a you're using hot steam to spin a turbine. We don't we can't do that. Kathy, um, one other thing when you mentioned conservation of what we're actually doing now um, brings to mind the plan that DSO has, and if they think that you know <laughs> they're not yet at things, so <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it was proposed that all the lighting be switched to LEDs, and they thought it was such a good idea that they were going to get a loan to pay for the transition uh, all at once so that they start the savings immediately because it's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my god, if they think it's a good idea, I think I better do it. So I have switched quite a few of my uh, in-place lighting to LEDs and um, can't vouch for savings yet. but. Uh, I, that's another thought of a way to go. And we have, I mean, we, we went to CFLs and we've switched a lot of ours to LEDs and we're working on completing that. That's some of the energy conservation things we've been working on. Also between facilities and green sanctuary and trying to get that all done. So we're working on that and combined together, you know, why are we using more energy than we need to? There's a solar panel, a block. But I drive by it, it's like Cass and Selden or something, and it fills, it fills a lot there. Yeah. So people are trying. Right, know? and I think 
Maurice, I know our the the vendor for the solar when he talked, he's located in Novi and he said it's taken him. He ends up spending a lot of time working with city planners for the individual cities and towns because the approval process can be eight months when because they don't understand it, so they don't, you know, so it, it, it takes it needs to be a groundswell of more people doing it. And more people aren't doing it because in the past it was much more cost prohibitive than it is now. You had a question over there, do you still? I had a, an observation and a question, but what is it? I guess a couple of years ago, the church was certified green. And so to do that, you have to meet certain standards for uh, energy efficiency in the church. And I've always seen that uh, the low hanging fruit is energy conservation, was just mentioned. You know, glazed windows, perfect insulation in the ceiling, all of this stuff that you can do that will sh cut down the use of energy, summer and winter. And it's no maintenance once you, once you put it in. And I think we should push on that and make sure that's in perfect before we go on to the next month. Actually, quite a bit of that has been done. Um, we've replaced a lot of plate glass windows with insulated panels. Right. A lot of the lighting has been upgraded. Um, the the I'm sorry. I mean, heat is, you know, yeah, well, there, we're, right the road. we're limited in how much insulation we can do because the construction is already in place. The walls are as thick as they are. The access to the areas above the ceiling is limited. Um, you have to be careful about ventilation. You don't want to create right. condensation problems, et cetera, et cetera. So while we have done a lot of that work, there is a limit to what we can do that way. We, we have done quite a lot, um, and, and really pretty much completed that aspect of it. Uh, not that there's not more we can do. And as technology evolves, you know, when we were making replacements, we were using CFLs. Now LEDs are coming into a price rate where they're affordable, more affordable, and the uh, calculation makes more sense now. So obviously we'll continue to try to make it as conservation-minded as possible. Right, I'm just saying that conservation is the biggest thing. Absolutely, absolutely. It is the least and expensive way of using your, your right. energy bill. But we, we've already recouped a lot of those, and we probably, I believe, the church, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly, spends about 28000 annually between gas and electricity. You know, we're not going to cut that down much more, again, because we've already taken the low-hanging fruit on that, some of the other things, even we don't have enough insulation in areas, but the only way to get that would be to break down concrete walls, and, and that's not going to happen either. So we feel this is kind of our next logical step. We certainly want to continue to do the conservation things. Another clarification on the Green Sanctuary. It, it, the certification didn't say, certify that we were 100% a green facility. Um, as far as the physical plan, it meant that we were conscious of these things. We were working towards it. We incorporated it in our education, in our worship services, etc. So, but along that line, though, I mean, if, if the idea is that well, we're not putting in LEDs right now because we know in four years the price is going to be down even more, and that's the time to do it. You see this development timeline going. Right. I think you could probably see this development timeline going also, also for solar panels and. Yes. Stuff is going to be better engineered and cheaper five years from now. That's well, I'm not sure how when capital monies will totally be available. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a separate issue. Yeah. One more? Um, I'm concerned about the intermediary step, which you said this mm -hmm. will get the more detailed studies done and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, that we would spend a lot of money on the one that is so complex that we would waste. Okay. And we'll take that into consideration. Yes, yeah. we're right. Right. Yeah. Yep. I mean, she, she also, she brings up an important point. And if we're going to spend $5,000 on a study, we could buy a gas first with the social pump for $5,000 or something. Mm -hmm. and, and fix that problem right now for the next seven or eight years and then re revisit it. I say that should be an option that's put in along with these other things we're going to spend right. yep. for a true comparison. Is our normal replacement? We'll certainly take that under advisement. 
And this can yeah. one uh, final thing here. Well, what I wanted to do is to thank you all for being here today and to say that if you have an interest in these aspects, there are a number of different ways you can participate. Of course, it would be wonderful if you could join the, the Green Sanctuary Committee. Um, however, uh, if you have areas of expertise, as, as this gentleman does, or you have things that you're particularly interested, we would like to hear that. If you could email either myself uh, or Karen uh, to tell us what the area is that you have some expertise in, that you might be able to do some legwork for us. Um, the other thing is that uh, the Green Sanctuary maintains a Facebook page under BUC's Facebook page, but you can go straight to that Green Sanctuary page through BUCMI.org. On that page, we have uh, pros and cons of fracking, pros and cons of the pipeline, and all the local uh, actions, uh, like the actions to uh, pressure DTE to reduce its coal consumption. All kinds of actions going on in the community are announced on that Facebook page. Uh, it's the Green Sanctuary Facebook page, which you can reach through the BUC Facebook page, and you can reach them both through BUCMI.org. So we can email if you can't come to committee meetings. You know, we can email back and forth. We can exchange information. We can call on you when there's going to be a site visit uh, to one of these installations, like the church in Ann Arbor. So please get yourself onto our interest list, and we will let you know about everything that's going on. Well, I'd first like to thank um, Karen, uh, Dan, and Annis for uh, starting off with a real model of a town hall. I think it's been very productive, and uh, like a good town hall, I think there's many questions. Hopefully, we'll find some answers as we go through the next few months. This is not uh, necessarily a time-limited process. Um, there are intermediate steps that we've already discussed that may be considered, um, but I encourage you all to stay a part of it. Uh, by staying in contact with the group that you have on stage, as well as um, as with the board. And I also want to thank you very much for coming, expressing your interest, and playing a role in the democratic process here at BUC. Thanks a lot.